Hello and welcome to What the Tech from Boast AI, where we talk with some of the brilliant minds behind new and exciting tech initiatives to learn what it takes to tackle technological uncertainty and eventually change the world. Today, I am thrilled to welcome onto the show, Sophia Winstead, co-founder and CEO of Blip Energy. At Blip, Sophia and her team are on a mission to redefine home batteries to increase energy resilience for both individuals and communities. By designing a product to work without typical installation constraints, Blip Energy is able to add millions of otherwise inaccessible homes to the smart grid network. Sophia's team is set on finding new ways to manage energy demand while ensuring that energy stability is an option for all of us, not just folks who can afford a luxury system. It's a lofty mission, but Sophia and her team have the background to make it happen. Drawing on experience working as a mechanical engineer and later as a program manager at iRobot before pivoting into the energy space with work at Exelon and Tesla. All of this is rooted in Sophia's passion for climate justice and energy equity, which she demonstrated through active involvement driving STEM education outreach. It's a field that's rife with innovation and opportunity, and I can't wait to pick Sophia's brain on what's in store for her team and the industry in the new year. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Sophia. Yeah, thanks so much, Paul. It's really good to be here. Absolutely. So for starters, I'd love to hear about your background. We gave a little bit about some of the work you've done in the past, but how did you get into the space in the first place and what's really driving your passion for energy and sustainability? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think I'm someone who's passionate about a lot of things, but I, I had a little bit of a moment when I was thinking about pivoting out of engineering, um, wanted to have more of a seat at the table at, for what are we building, who are we building it for, and why. And I realized that can apply to a lot of different things, but if we don't have a habitable planet, some of my passions around education and equity kind of fall by the wayside if we don't have anywhere to live. So wanted to focus on making sure that we have somewhere to live so that we can focus on some of those other problems as well. Um, so as, as you mentioned, I was, a, I was a mechanical engineer, worked on Roomba, so I built robotic vacuum cleaners. Pretty much one of the coolest jobs you can get out of college is building robots that go in people's homes, but wanted to go towards something I was a little bit more passionate about actually went and, and got a and product design. So I was one of those students that needed to learn how businesses work. What is accounting? Why do we care about it? Um, having come from an engineering background, I didn't have any of that context. And that was where the idea for Blip really started uh, working with a couple of other folks. Met my co-founder uh, in grad school, his background's in utilities and federal policy. So he's got all the context that our hardware sits in. And then actually spent some time at Exelon uh, scoping out new technologies and how we can help bring new technologies to engage customers. And then actually worked at Tesla uh, as a product manager for their energy order portal. So everywhere from when you put in your uh, zip code and your utility bill through to where you click purchase uh, and learned a ton about the energy space uh, and, and those sort of products there. That is so cool. I want to go back to a point you said early when you were giving your answer, actually, that having a seat at a table. Now, you've worked for some really, really big companies who ostensibly are making strides in the space. But could you unpack a little bit what you mean about having a seat at a table and what that looks like for you as a founder and in driving your mission forward at Flip? Yeah, I think I definitely bring this human centered design focus. Uh, now with a little bit more understanding of exactly what that means. But I think that that was really my ethos even when I was just an individual contributor. And I think a lot of people who have worked as an individual contributor can understand like you've, you're you given a problem to solve, even as an engineer, right? You're given a problem to solve. But all of the constraints are dictated by, we're doing a cost down initiative. Um, we've done a marketing study and we've found that this feature needs to be added to the product. And so you're given a tiny little bite-sized part of the problem and it's important and you need to solve it. But what I was really interested in was the bigger problem of who are we building this for? Why are we building this in the first place? And wanted to be more a part of those conversations and to be able to bring my perspective to it and to bring my opinion to it, which is, I think, tough at a big company, especially in an individual contributor role. I think as a founder, it's the opposite where there's, Few yeah. people even else at the table. Um, you are the <laughs> table, for lack of a better term. But I think I, I just wanted to, to give a hand. I think I, as I mentioned, I feel passionately about a lot of things and being able to bring that passion into the decisions that are being made and, and feel good about that and not feel like you're being handed a problem down from however many levels of people it has to go through before they actually sort of decide what's happening. Absolutely. I think... I'm thinking back actually to an episode that we dropped yesterday with uh, Daniel Rizzi, where he was 
talking about something kind of similar there. He was more talking about how the pandemic kind of pushed him to rethink, do I really want to be in the corporate hierarchy? Do I really want to be doing the nine to five? He similarly is very passionate about stuff. And that's something that's a theme with all of the founders we talk to. Obviously, I think table stakes, you need just a baseline level of energy and then the passion to really see that solution through. So I just love that that keeps ringing through and we're having these conversations and we're learning about the background and that folks definitely are giving it a try going the old way. But when you see, like you had even noticed that, hey, I'm kind of being handed down the solu- the problem that I'm trying to solve, not actually going after the problems that I think are the most impactful and then taking that action. I think that's something that a lot of folks might be afraid to do, but they don't necessarily have the examples to follow. So it's awesome to hear that you did that it's been succeeding. I'd love to know a little bit more now specifically about Blip. You had mentioned too that you had met your co-founder back in school. Um, mm-hmm. I'd love to know a little bit about what the process of kind of getting the skill sets together and getting the team together to get your idea off the ground looked like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, honestly, I think that I was immensely privileged to be in an educational system where they were teaching a lot of those skills. That being said, a ton of it's available online. Like, just just being honest, I, I think yep. educational systems are fantastic. I would be a perpetual master's student if I had unlimited funds. So a, a lot of it was both going through courses um, around ideating and launching startups. I was also, as I mentioned, I was getting this master's in design innovation, which is basically product design. So a lot of that was around how to do customer discovery how to have an interview without asking leading questions, like how to really get to what the pain point is because people, humans want to answer the question, right? Like it's kind of just a part of being human. So you have to be really thoughtful about how you're wording questions and asking people about their routine to make sure that you're not leading them to the answer that you already think is going to happen. So I was getting all of that in the, in the design innovation portion of my degree. And then on the business side, it was like, how do we actually, what is accounting? Like, how do we do this? Why do taxes matter? And how are they going to impact me? And turns out taxes are important, but as a startup, like we're not going to have a taxable basis for a bit. Absolutely. So that was definitely part of it. And then thinking about our team, obviously we have very different skill sets and making sure that we didn't have the exact same background. Like my background is in engineering and product. And I spent time in Southeast Asia standing up manufacturing. My co-founder Chance's business background is totally different. He did utility consulting. He spent a lot of time optimizing utilities. He spent time in Washington doing federal policy for General Electric. So he's got a totally different side of the house. And I think that that's one of the reasons that we've been able to build and design a product that end users and utility operators actually want and need on both sides of the house because we can speak both languages. We also, I'll say we went through accelerator and incubator programs. There's a lot of great programs out there. I think that taught us a lot of the nitty gritty around like how to run a fundraising process. And one big thing that I had to learn was like how to do product design and product development roadmap without the capital and the clout of a, of a big established company. Like doing product design as a startup is totally different than doing product design as uh, a company that has existing manufacturing relationships and you can just call them up and ask for a couple of prototypes. So a lot of those came through connections, mentors, incubator programs, um, and then just books. I love it. Yeah. And I actually, not to ding education or academia or anything like that, or the institutions in place, but I love that you made that point about so much being available online to go way back to, uh, in your answer. And also later on, when you mentioned too, that you were in incubator programs, you've worked with accelerators and you got that kind of community resource that I think is not something that academia offers at all, to be honest. If anything, I think there's a barrier to entry when you enter those spaces. Whereas if you do go with an accelerator that is going to also enjoy in your success, but give you access to more folks. There's just a lot you can wring dry from that. Um, so again, not to ding academia because it's invaluable, especially if you go to some of the best schools. But I do think that a lot of founders too, they find their way once they find those partners in the community and they find people who are actually like in the weeds doing it and not thinking of it from a theory perspective. I think another point that you made, which was interesting, and I'm going to go back to some of the founders who we interview on the show as examples, but... Oh. Some founder teams, it's usually teams, it's usually one or two or three people, but those teams, 
can either be people who like, hey, we went to middle school together, or this is somebody who I know through high school, we've always been passionate about X cause and together our dream has made it. I think in positions like what Blip Energy is trying to do, where you really want to make change on a global scale and you want to make change that's impactful to, I mean, again, global scale, humanity, you got to stretch and think outside of your comfort zone, which is what you did. You had mentioned Chance. He worked in the utility sector. He had that bureaucratic experience, it sounds like, that really complemented your deep tech experience or your experience at least like you had said, seeing how things are manufactured and going there and understanding the processes to make the solution him getting it to the markets necessarily that might be needed or even the people for that. So just wanted to draw a connection there too, because I think some founders think there's just one way. And it's almost like the shark tank of the world. It's kind of ruined us all. We all think, hey, you've got to be founders of somebody who you are either related to or you've known for decades. And then you got to go the VC route and you got to hand over equity and just... That is not the roadmap for most, or at least many founders. So I'd love to talk a little bit more too. You had started digging into the product design and kind of the differences um, between doing that in the startup space and then doing that when you have that corporate backing. I'd love to know more about some of that unique R&D that goes into what you guys are doing over at Blip. And if you could just tell me about some of the cool innovations you guys are working on. Obviously, we don't want to sell the secret sauce here on the show, but anything in that realm, I'd love to dig in. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we are doing right now is actually gathering data in the field to continue to train our backend algorithm. So one thing that separates us from a battery that you might pick up at Home Depot is that we have taken all of the decision burden off of the household. A lot of these utility programs, especially the ones where they have a variable rate plan or time like real-time pricing, and they'll send you a text when the price goes up or whatever, but that means that you, the person, have to what run around your house and turn things off. Um, there's starting to be more and more integrations. We're actually super excited about um, Apple's new grid forecast feature that they rolled out. So that means that they are sort of starting to track things on the grid. Would be excited if they actually integrated more pricing and not just like whether it's a dirty or clean time, but hopefully right. they'll get there or we'll get there for them. So that's a lot of what we're doing in the background is actually tracking what the utility price is, what the load is connected to the battery, and then predicting out to be able to save households the most money and to be able to respond to real-time grid signals and make the most impact there. That decision algorithm obviously gets more and more complicated. Uh, if it's one thing that's attached and one window where the price gets high, it's pretty easy, right? That's just basically a schedule. You start to add three, four, or five different prices throughout the day. Uh, different charge windows, because we want to make sure the battery's charged to make the most advantage of the place where you're going to be able to save the most money based on when your air conditioner is historically running. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of what we've been working on recently is starting to gather more data with a couple of units that are out in the field. Actually, I have one in my house right now running a space heater because it's been negative 10 degrees in Chicago so that we can start to actually gather real data to, to train up that algorithm. So that's one of the big things that we've been working on recently. That's that's awesome. It's actually funny. I turned off my space heater right before we had this call. I'm based in Boston, as listeners would know, and you're based in Chicago. It is so cold mm -hmm. here. And I was like, I'm going to be talking about energy efficiency. I just adjusted our Nest thermostat, and then I turned on a space heater. What am I doing? So I got to get my act in order on that front. But um, Or you need more dynamic, intelligent tools to help you because you've got enough to do throughout the day. And that's that's really where we're trying to make it seamless. You have to make it easy for people to participate in this market. You can't be turning off their air conditioner. You can't be sending them a text and asking them to walk around their house and turn things off. Like that's one of the things we really believe. And how we are actually connecting customers and utilities is yep. by making it seamless as possible. I uh, Yeah. I mean, I work from home and I don't want to make it sound like it's super laborious, but I'm like, why is my office where I'm recording my podcast always 10 degree colder than the rest of the house? Why do I have three apps on my phone that are supposed to tell me what's going on, including the indoor and outdoor weather temp? And just I'm always just running in circles trying to get the temperature comfortable. And this is very much not an acute issue, but it's the life I'm leading in my work from home setting. So wanted to go in a little bit to you had talked about to the kind of funding. And I think that this goes into a little bit 
about the R&D and about the product development to when you're in the corporate setting or if you have a corporate backer, obviously there's money there and there's ways to fund your innovation. Could you tell me a little bit about without, again, giving away secret sauce or saying anything that you might not be at liberty to say yet, how you're funding Flip today and what yeah. um, whether it's an equity stake or whether it is non-dilutive funding, what's kind of the mix here for you guys? Yeah, so up to date, we've been doing a, a combination of non-dilutive funding, whether that's grants, whether that's competitions, uh, and then equity-based financing with uh, individual angels, a couple of institutional investors, a couple of uh, strategic investors. Moving forward, I think that there's, especially for batteries and domestic batteries, there's some really great debt financing options, um, small business loans and other things, but we're at a stage right now where we need to get a little bit farther until we start sort of really digging into the debt financing part of the stack. Um, so that's what we've been doing so far. We actually really excitingly were selected for a grant from the Department of Energy. Um, yeah, that's how we awesome. thought it. So it's, it's a $1.1 million grant. It's a three-year project term. We're going to be working with another startup and with Argonne National Labs on, and it's the the title of the subtopic is exactly what we're doing, which is accelerating the accessible deployment of energy storage. Uh, so being able to have a grant like that, both for just the endorsement from the DOE that they care, they think that what we're doing is also a good idea. And obviously the funding has been, has been huge for us, but venture, I think for our stage is it's a part of it. We can't only okay. work off of grant funding and we've got some really great, uh, angels that are in the space that have been really great advisors for us as well. For sure. Absolutely. Um, congrats. First off, like you had said, that funding, the dollar sign on its own is nothing to sneeze at. Wow. So happy for you guys. But <clears throat> I just think that bona fide is so valuable. Um, getting the DOE's kind of validation for you. Oh my God. That's yeah. I mean, you guys are going to be very, very busy as you embark on further funding rounds, just having that kind of badge of honor with you because it's not something given out lightly and it's a priority. Um, I've, I mean, check out the Boast blog. We write about it often, but the government really, really, really does want to support this kind of innovation. It is a top priority for them. So ignore what you might hear in the news. It, it's not something that is being taken lightly or ignored. So this is fantastic. And I'm very glad that you guys are able to dive in on that. Um, we only have about a couple minutes left. So I kind of want to get your take on the larger state of the startup ecosystem. I'd love to know because I have the unique opportunity to have you here, maybe from the clean tech or the green energy space, just what advice would you give to founders who are maybe trying to, if not launch a product, get involved more in that sector? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I will be a little bit cliche and say like, all jobs are climate jobs, if yeah. you're thinking about it in a certain way. Obviously not entirely true, but I think that there's, there is an ability to make a lot of impact in whatever role you're in, especially even uh, if you're working in HR, make sustainability goals part of everyone's end of your review. If you're working in operations, like there may be something that you can do that can help that company be a little bit more sustainable, that's gonna have a lot more impact than doing something else. So I think just my my quick plug for like, we're, we all have to pull for this and that's startups and established companies together. And like any job can be a climate job if you're passionate enough about it and you have buy-in from your managers and all of those other things, it gets complicated. I think for folks that are looking to get more involved in the startup ecosystem, I mean, there's tons of, there's Climate Connect um, is sort of a nationwide, it's in various cities and uh, states as an organization, but that's, there's a Chicago Climate Connect and it's been a great mix of, later career professionals, startup founders, people just out of college that are looking for just to network. Um, and that's been a really cool, just like diverse pool of people to get to know. I think too, in terms of like, what advice would I give people that are looking to get involved? It's touching every aspect of our economy. Right. So if you can leverage what you already know and where your expertise already lies, that can be a really good jumping off point. Before I started Flip, I was like, ah, I don't want to make consumer electronics anymore. I want to do something important. And then turns out my brain solved the problem with the way that I know how to solve the problem, which is making consumer electronics. But we've been able to design something that's going to be really impactful. So you don't have to like totally change everything about what you're working on or what your background is. See if there's something that's aligned with what you already are really good at 
And how can you leverage your existing knowledge base? And I think that that can be a really good jumping off point for people. I, I love that. I'm going to repeat after you. Leverage your existing knowledge base. Um, your skills are your skills. Do what you know how to do and do it well and trust your team to cover the bases. So if you're not necessarily ready to go talk to bureaucrats in DC necessarily, but your skill set is in actually building a solution like you did and building a consumer electronics piece too, follow that. Apply it to the industry that you want to make a difference in, but don't think you have to leave the skills that you've built from your career to date on the table or behind you when you go into a new field. I think that is awesome advice. Um, Sophia, this has been fantastic. It's, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today. Uh, I'm really excited about what y'all are working at on at Boast as well. I think that there's a ton of opportunity there and it's super important work. Speaking of just how climate is touching every part of the economy. Um, so really appreciate being able to chat with you today and uh, looking forward to staying in touch. Yeah, and I, I very much took to heart when you were saying to every job's a climate job. Obviously, making you hop on the podcast and producing all of these doesn't seem implicit to that. But I love that at Boast, we get to touch those companies and we get to help them capture that funding to really drive that innovation. And more and more and more, too, it, it's a lot of that green tech. It's a lot of that sustainability. We live on a planet that isn't going to be here forever if we don't take care of it, or at least inhabitable for us. So we got to do good by our own home here. So I love that that's kind of the opportunity I have and the role that I can play there. I'm sure there's a lot more I can do and will do in the future, but um, you did make me feel better about that just from those words. So thank you so much, Sophia. This was fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much.